my name is Christine Oliver. I've been painting watercolors for 19 years. And today we're going to paint a calla lily. Very simply, I'll, I'll show you step by step how to get started. So we're going to paint this lovely calla lily. And the way I start each of my paintings is to do my value sketch first. The value sketch helps me work out the composition of the painting. In this particular case, it's going to be a vertical. And I want to get um, the calla lily placed so that I know exactly where my lights are going to be and where my darks are going to be. So I'm going to draw this in. The value sketch does not have to be a work of art. It just has to give you um, the basic guidelines of what it is that you're going to be painting. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you in just a second what I'm going to do here. I want to make sure that the basic shape of the calla lily is shown. And I want to also show, I'm not going to do all of the leaves, but I'm going to do some of them. And that is using your artist prerogative. You can include or exclude as much as you want from your paintings. Um, just because it's there in front of you doesn't mean you have to include it. So that's always a good thing to remember. Um, the the uh, value sketch is particularly important when you're painting still lifes because a still life um, can be composed, no, excuse me, a landscape, sorry about that. A landscape can be composed in a number of ways. Well, also a still life too, as a matter of fact. So you can move items around for a still life and with a landscape, you can decide what you're going to include and what you're going to exclude. So it's always good to get your value sketch drawn. And I'll show you in a second what, um, what this is going to look like. So I'm working out my composition now as I actually draw it. I'm just using a number two soft pencil. Um, it's not any kind of a special pencil, but it works really well. Okay. With watercolor, the drama of the watercolor is when you have your lightest lights and your darkest darks next to the center of interest. And with good composition, you want to make sure that you give the eye a way to get into the picture. That is very, very important. Um, you want to make sure that you're not leading the eye out of the picture and that there is a pathway for the eye to keep going around and around and seeing new things in your picture. So th those are the most important things in my um, opinion. Okay, so I'm almost done with this. Just have a few more leaves that I want to put in. The calla lily is such a lovely heart shape, and I want to make sure that I have enough dark areas around it to really make that shape stand out. And you will not, and I'll show you this, you don't have to paint every single leaf exactly as it is shown. You just want to give the sense of leaves being there. 
and I can show you how to simplify backgrounds so that you don't feel like you have to get every twist and turn of a leaf in. Okay, almost finished here. Okay, so if you look at what I have drawn, you can actually see the calla lily very well in this shape. And I brought in enough of the darks of the vegetation around so that the calla lily is the center of interest. And that is the area that um, you're going to see the most. I like the darks, dark areas such as here and above the lily and over here on the side because that helps to accentuate. Now I'm going to take um, this value sketch and I keep this handy so that I can test out colors and I make sure I'm mixing the right colors. And I'm going to transfer the uh, picture to my block. And I'm using an Arches 140 9 by 12 block of watercolor paper. And this is um, cold press. Um, it is a very forgiving paper. And I recommend it to all my beginning students. Uh, if you're going to spend money uh, buying materials, spend it on the paper because the paper is probably the uh, least forgiving of all the other elements. You're, you can start out with student grade paint and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. And you can start out with brushes that are not, you know, super expensive. Because what you're doing really is you're learning. I use a kneaded eraser, again, because it does not um, create crumbles on the piece on my um, page and it, it's very clean and you can clean it also by um, by uh, stretching it. Okay now what I want to make sure I depict in this is where the shadows are in the calla lily, in the center of the calla lily. Because that is going to actually define the shape of the petals and the shape of the, um, the flower itself. So that's really, really important to, to know where your shadows are. I'm going to add um, a few of the uh, leaves around it. And I love the fact that in this particular photograph, there are, there's a really dark background. I think that's going to be very, very dramatic as we leave the water, um, the calla lily, nice and white, and we put in um, all the darks of the leaves in the background around it. I had a student ask me once, <coughs> excuse me, how you paint a white flower because your paper is white. And with watercolor, the white of your paintings is the white of the paper. And I said, really, what you have to do is you paint the shadows. So shadows are extremely important when you're uh, painting white flowers because that is what actually gives you the shape of the flower. Now I'm putting this on very, very lightly and um, you can, there are some people that like to erase their pencil lines after they have drawn them in. I don't necessarily um, 
care. Most of the pencil lines won't show much at all anyway. But if it bothers you, you can certainly <coughs> um, erase them after you get your um, painting done, completed. You can probably erase them best after your first layer of paint. And with watercolor, you can probably easily do four layers of paint uh, before you start to get mud, muddy colors. You don't want to do very much more than that. So I teach a four-layer um, four method. The first layer is basically color blocking, and that means putting the colors that um, are in the objects in the painting in the areas where they are, where they belong. And then the next is adding your uh, medium colors, your medium shades. Then you add your darks. And in the second layer with the medium shades, you start building your textures of branches, leaves, um, building materials if you're doing architecture, etc. And then um, your last layer is um, shadows and the shadows ground your painting. All right, so I have put this on. I think you can see it. It's very, very light. We move the box so you can see the light um, shades of the uh, pencil marks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, um, I'm going to start by putting in, mixing um, colors for the leaves. And I'm going to do the leaves first because I want to get those in there first. So I'm using a little aureolin. That's my lightest yellow. You'll see that here. And in fact, I'm going to use my mixing brush, which is an older brush, so I don't wreck the tip of my good brush. And I'm putting quite a bit of this color on my palette because I want to start out with this as a base underneath my um, the rest of the leaves. I'm going to add a little bit of cobalt blue and you'll get a nice green, okay? That's probably, I need a little more yellow. Um, one of the things that you can do is you can mix your colors on your palette next to each other, but not on top of each other, um, so that you can draw from various colors and you can get darker or lighter or whatever, um, whatever you may need for that particular part of the painting. So here I'm going to let me try a little new gamboge too. That's a, that's a new gamboge. It's also a lovely yellow. It has a little bit more orange in it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the yellow. And I'm going to put it in the areas where I see most of my leaves. I've drawn some of my leaves um, out to the edge and some inside the edge. So I want this base of, of light color first and then I'll start adding my uh, blues which will turn it more green. I see a little bit of like a yellow tinge on the edge of um, some of these leaves. Always when you're mixing colors on your palette, try to remember to put enough paint on your palette. Don't be stingy about your paint. Um, I have some small tubes that are very small. They're about the size of my finger, my little finger. And I have been painting with those for about 19 years, and I'm just now running out. So it doesn't take much paint, 
and that's the one thing that you definitely want to um, you want to saturate your colors you want to get enough colors in when you're um, doing something that is uh, going to be dramatic like this painting will be so you'll notice I'm going around my uh, calla lily and before I do any more I want to add a little bit of the green or the blue here this color so that I can start to build um, the leaves and I'm and I'm just I'm going to be very this is going to be very loose a very loose painting I want it um, I want to get spontaneity into the painting so I'm painting wet on wet now you'll notice that um, I put the yellow down first and then I'm going back in with the blue it turns into green because blue and yellow make green and um, and I want I want to just start building this out and you'll notice I'm not I'm not being um, super particular I'm just letting the colors flow and and sometimes it's nice to not um, do a painting that looks like a photograph sometimes what I love absolutely love about watercolor is you can actually see the brush strokes and you can see the pigments and you can see how they flow together and that's one of the things that I think is so lovely about watercolor paints um, you can uh, do representational and it can look like a photograph or you can go to the absolute opposite um, extreme and paint very loose wet on wet and have it be very abstract so you've got a wide range of ways that you can use your watercolor the most important thing as a beginner starting out is to learn how much water you put um, on your brush in your brush how much pigment and how the the paper accepts the water that is very very important now that is a very turquoise green and that was the Windsor green blue shade I don't use that a lot because um, quite honestly you don't find that in nature much a way to um, actually tone that down is to go with the opposite color and put red into that color and that is a great way to dull that that uh, that bright bright um, green down so I wanted to just mix a little bit of that because I am going to be using that shortly in the painting but first I'm going to go back to my aureolin and uh, and, and do my initial this is the first layer you start out light and you go to dark you start out with big shapes and you go to small and you start often from the top and you go to the bottom of your painting so you're doing when you're doing a landscape it's the background first then the middle ground then the foreground okay all right let's do a little more of my cobalt blue and I just want to make sure I have some of the areas And most of this is I'm doing wet on dry but then when I start to add the um, the cobalt blue to the yellow aureole and yellow then it becomes a wet on wet process that you can see a 
Okay, almost done with my leaves. The one thing with watercolor is if you have um, a wet area next to a dry area, then the pigment won't flow into the dry area. But if you have two wet areas that you're working on and they um, touch, then the pigments will bleed. It's capillary action and it will bleed right out of the area that you're working on. So if you don't want um, areas to bleed, then for heaven's sakes, let everything dry. And that's the, that's the hardest part because you're having to um, be patient for letting things dry. Mm -hmm.